The first point I want to make in this video is that there are great uncertainties about the eventual amount of warming, the rate of warming, and the consequences of global warming. This means that these are decisions that have to be made under a lot of uncertainty. Some people have suggested that it would be better to wait until all the uncertainty is resolved. However, that could potentially take either a few centuries or forever. It's such a complicated phenomenon that we may never be able to fully understand, uh, fully resolve all the uncertainties. Um, and it doesn't seem like a wise idea to refrain from taking any action at all before all uncertainties are resolved. In the same kind of way that a uh, general during a war wouldn't want to refrain from making any decisions until he knew everything about the plans of his enemy, because then it might be too late. So certainly this is a situation where we have to make decisions under uncertainty, and those decisions will, in hindsight, almost inevitably not appear to be optimal, but we don't, we don't have the, the knowledge that we will eventually have. The next point here, to compare global warming with other forms of air pollution. Global warming is different in the following senses. First, there's no so-called end-of-pipe solution. An end-of-pipe solution is like the solution to, as we'll see in a future chapter, uh, uh, sulfur dioxide emission. You just put a so-called scrubber at uh, the end of, at the top of a smokestack of a coal-fired power plant, and you can get rid of the sulfur emissions. But it's much harder to capture carbon emissions. And it may be possible to capture carbon emissions from from large industrial plants like uh, electric generating stations, but to capture carbon emissions from, let's say, an automobile, uh, every one of the millions of automobiles around the Earth seems not to be possible. So no end of pipe solution. Uncertainty of future impact. Now, it's not that we know everything about all other kinds of air pollution, but certain, certainly the uncertainties involved in uh, global warming are much more than the uncertainties involved in, let's say, uh, the health effect of emitting mercury into the air. Uh, mercury is a neurotoxin. We can do experiments to understand how that neurotoxin causes damage to people and other living things. And it's a, re it's a much more straightforward scientific problem than all the different ramifications of global warming. The next two things here are linked. The lag between emission and impact and long atmospheric lifetimes. So the lag between emission and impact means the carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gases that we emit now are going to have impacts not only for the next few months, or even for the next few years, but potentially for the next few centuries. And of course, that's intimately connected here with the long atmospheric lifetimes, because CO2 in particular has a half-life in the atmosphere, excuse me, that's measured in uh, centuries. Methane doesn't. Uh, the methane that we emit now is going to disappear after a few decades, but that's not true of carbon dioxide. And a pretty dramatic example of, of, of these long atmospheric lifetimes and the lag between emission and impact was given by this book here I wanted to, to highlight, The World Without Us, uh, written by Alan Weissman in, in here in 2008. Um, got several uh, awards when the book first came out. This is a book composed of chapters, each of which discuss what would happen to a different aspect of the natural world if humans disappeared all of a sudden. And so one chapter is about global warming. What happens if all humans uh, died uh, tomorrow? Uh, what would happen to the Earth's climate? And what the book says is that because of the long atmospheric lifetimes of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, and because of the lag between emission and impact, if all humans disappeared tomorrow, the global mean temperature would continue to rise for about another millennium, that is about another 1,000 years. 
And after that, it would stabilize. And after a few centuries beyond that, the temperature would start to fall. And eventually, it would get back to its, uh, its natural levels. But that shows what kind of difficult problem uh, fixing global warming is going to be that even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, the climate is still going to warm for about another 1,000 years. This time scale is vastly greater than the time scales of other atmospheric pollution problems that, that I can think of. What are the effects of climate change and global warming? The book talks about the effects on agriculture first. And remember, the book was written in, let's see, what was the, uh, the copyright? In any case, it's talking about uh, both positive and negative effects on agriculture. The copyright is 1993. So most of the book was probably written in the 1980s. Uh, positive and negative effects, the idea being that uh, Canada's wheat production might increase because now the climate in Canada becomes warmer, and so there's some areas in Canada which are now too cold to grow wheat, but now they'll be able to grow wheat. And so one way of modeling the agricultural impact, which is what was done by dear William Nordhaus of Yale University, would be to think of the optimal areas of growing crops uniformly moving away from the equator and so perhaps the wheat production in the US would fall but the wheat production in the in Canada and in Russia would increase and so let me read what the book writes about Nordhaus's conclusion thus William Nordhaus of Yale University 1991 takes an optimistic scenario approach on this basis, he states that climate change is likely to produce a combination of gains and losses with no strong presumption of substantial net economic damages. The book contrasts this with uh, another author named, I believe, Klein. Yes, on page 275, the book says, Klein, 1992, favors a le less optimistic scenario, assuming that climate change will lead to more significant social disruption. Klein's damage estimates are much higher than those of Nordhaus, and he includes in his calculations less easily quantified impacts like species loss, migration, that is, migration of humans to avoid, uh, for example, increased sea levels, and infrastructure degradation. So I'm reading from page, st started on page 275, the sentence continues to page 277. Now, a modern take from the year 2020, of course, is that it's highly unlikely that climate change is going to have important positive effects really on anything. Even think about agriculture. Um, first off, um, there are going to be changes in rainfall patterns, which could adversely affect agriculture. The Intermountain Western part of the U.S., like Utah, is projected to become drier, and therefore agriculture is going to be harder to undertake. There can be a change of disease patterns, both human and plant diseases. So with increased temperatures, you often get more disease. Uh, the plant diseases could attack plants and decrease crop yields. You also have an increase in human diseases. There's an entire branch of medical medicine called tropical medicine, which is about diseases that only occur in the tropics. It is in warm areas. For example, mosquito-borne diseases such as malaria. And if you have a warming climate, then a greater part of the Earth's surface is going to be uh, subject to those kinds of diseases. Uh, the next point here, inundation of low-lying coastal areas. Before I get into details here, let me just go back to the discussion on Nordhaus. Um, but clearly, inundation of low-lying coastal areas means some uh, places that we now grow crops are going to be underneath the ocean. Um, in addition, the notion that, let's say, the, the area for growing a certain crop is just going to smoothly uh, 
move away from the equator isn't correct. Take a crop like coffee. So um, coffee plants grow in high altitude places near the tropics on hillsides. Now when the climate gets warmer the the coffee plants will have to be cultivated at a higher and higher altitude. But at some point you run out of mountain. You get to the top of the mountain and then there's only air above it. You can't cultivate co coffee plants in the air. So it's not necessarily so that when the climate change you can just move the cultivation of a particular crop elsewhere. Uh, Nordhaus's uh, Nordhaus's model was essentially conventional wisdom among most neoclassical economists in the early 1990s. Uh, Nordhaus made his uh, name uh, by studying environmental and exhaustible resource problems. Clearly he was wrong, vastly too optimistic about his diagnosis of climate change. Um, other economists like Klein, whom I mentioned and whom your book talks about, were much more correct. Um, I don't really want to comment much about the sociology of the economics profession, but it so happens that uh, Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize in economics just a couple of years ago for his work on climate change, whereas other economists like Klein have been essentially forgotten. Now, to be fair, Nordhaus has come around to a, a much more pessimistic view of climate change recently. But if in the early 1990s, people like Nordhaus had actually taken a more, I'll use the word, realistic approach to climate change, which clearly people like the authors of your textbook and, uh, and people like Klein were doing at that time, if Nordhaus hadn't opposed those views but actually supported those views, then perhaps many more economists would have suggested in the early 1990s or even the 1980s that action be taken then to alleviate climate change. We would have had a much easier time tackling climate change then than we will now because the problem wasn't as bad then. We would have had several decades less of increasing emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So it's uh, really too bad that the main body of the neoclassical economics profession followed Nordhaus in thinking for many decades that climate change was not going to be the kind of really bad problem that we now know it is going to be. And as I said, that other people did suspect it was going to be at the time that Nordhaus was doing this kind of work in the early 1990s and in the 1980s. Well, let's talk a little bit more here about the Nile Delta and Bangladesh because the book uses them as examples of what can happen with increasing sea level rise. Now the sea level increases partially because warm water takes up more volume than colder water, but also because you have melting of the ice caps. Now melting of the ice, let's say in the Arctic Ocean, doesn't change the sea level in the same way that if you have some ice cubes in a glass of water and then you wait until the ice cubes melt, the melting of the ice cubes doesn't change the level of the water. However, if you have ice that's over land, like in Greenland and in Antarctica, then when it melts, clearly the ocean level is going to increase. So we're going to have ocean level increase, uh, inundation of low-lying coastal areas. Uh, the book points out in the Nile Delta it's particularly bad because not only do you have the ocean level increasing, but the ground level is subsiding, it's falling, because the Aswan High Dam, uh, which was built way back I think in the 60s or even 1950s, uh, the, uh, the Egyptian government, I believe, got the help of the Soviet Union to build this dam, um, stops lots of silt from traveling north in the Nile River and depositing in the, in the Nile Delta and building up the land. Instead, the silt gets trapped behind the dam, which is in southern Egypt, and so it never gets to the Nile Delta. And without this increasing, without this continuous deposition of silt, the land is sinking. 
So you have a combination of sinking land and increasing ocean level. And this is bad because you lose freshwater fish. You may lose sources of fresh drinking water because the wells might, the aquifers might get contaminated with seawater because as the sea level rises, the pressure of sea level uh, essentially it, 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 it uh, it, it seeps into the ground and uh, uh, beyond the it, it gets beyond the coast uh, sea level in, intrudes into aquifers that are underneath dry land and that can contaminate the aquifers and of course uh, you have loss of farmland homes businesses that all have to be relocated cities like Alexandria in Egypt so you have uh, large economic damages. The other country the, the book highlights is Bangladesh. There are 26 million people living on the coastal zone of Bangladesh. If they all have to be relocated, it's not clear where they can be relocated. Bangladesh is a pretty small country. Its neighboring country, India, has, at least nowadays, a government which doesn't look very kindly on the religion of most Bangladeshi people, which is the Islamic religion, and so it's not clear what would happen uh, where, if these people had to migrate, w where they would go. There are also problems in Bangladesh in terms of saltwater intrusion and fears that the saltwater is going to contaminate the aquifers and so there's going to be a lack of drinking water. So that's true in both places. Um, other kind of low-lying coastal areas th that may have to be relocated include many of the largest cities in the world. New York City, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Los Angeles, Shanghai, uh, Bombay, Calcutta. Uh, there are many cities all around the world, major cities that are located right on the ocean coast and many of these would have to be relocated in part if not in whole when the oceans rise and this of course would be extremely expensive. Our next effect here is ocean acidification. Carbon dioxide concentration increasing in the atmosphere causes the constant carbon dioxide concentration to increase in the ocean as well by diffusion and it turns out that when carbon dioxide diffuses into water, it makes the water more acidic. This is bad news if you are a, for example, a shellfish, an organism that, uh, like a clam, that has a shell because the increased acidification of the ocean water can cause the shell to dissolve. And so lots of mollusks and other organisms like um, coral reef organisms could be in huge trouble because of ocean acidification. Next um, potential effect here is ocean current disruption. You probably know about the Gulf Stream which is a warm water current which uh, takes w warm water from the Caribbean near the coast of Atlantic coast of Florida uh, and, and transports it northeast across the Atlantic Ocean, across the North Atlantic, um, towards the UK, the British Isles it is, and uh, Northern Europe and the uh, Scandinavian Peninsula. This makes the climate of those areas, uh, the, the British Isles and Scandinavia, much warmer, and continental Europe too, like France and Germany, much warmer than the corresponding areas in North America. That is, if you take areas that are the same distance away from the equator in Europe and in North America, in North America you get cities like Calgary and Edmonton, and in Europe you get cities like London and Stockholm. Uh, which have much, much milder climates than Calgary and Edmonton. The worry of ocean current disruption is the following. We don't know entirely why ocean currents flow. Part of the reasons is because of wind, it's because of the rotation of the 
Earth. It's because of the particular geography of where the Earth's land masses are versus the oceans. But another reason might be because there's a salinity difference between the water at the top of the ocean and the water near the ocean floor. And salinity differences can actually cause water to move. In fact, in the Great Salt Lake, salinity differences between the top of the between the water at the top of the lake and the water at the bottom of the lake um, cause water to move and there are commercial plants that are built on the shore of the Great Salt Lake which extract minerals from the lake and they don't actually need many pumps. They can just trench fairly shallow uh, trenches in uh, on the bed of the Great Salt Lake and those small depth differences are enough to generate salinity differences where enough which are enough to generate currents which actually bring the mineral laden Great Salt Lake water to the shore. So it's been known for a long time that salinity differences can cause water to move. Uh, and, and we think that this is one reason why the Gulf Stream moves is because it, uh, there's a salinity difference between the water near the top of the shore and uh, near the top of the ocean and the water in the bottom of the ocean. Now think about the ice over Greenland melting. If the ice in Greenland melts, all that's fresh water because it came from snow, which of course is it doesn't have any salt in it. So the snow turned to ice. If it melts with global warming, then you start getting uh, meltwater into the North Atlantic, which doesn't have any salt. And so the top part of the North Atlantic, that is the the part of the water near the surface of the ocean, is going to become less saline. And the concern is that that could actually slow or even stop the Gulf Stream. If that were to happen, then potentially all of a sudden, the climate of Europe would be the same as the climate of interior Canada. In other words, uh, this would be a consequence of climate change, but it wouldn't be a warming, it would be a drastic cooling of the climate in Europe. Uh, speaking here particularly of Western Europe, which would completely change the agricultural possibilities and perhaps also all the economic possibilities of people living in that continent. So this is a pretty dramatic example of that um, Global climate change doesn't necessarily mean global warming, even though the global mean temperature would increase. And potentially, it could have very, very dramatic economic effects. I wanted to briefly show here a Wikipedia page that talks about this phenomenon called the shutdown of thermohaline circulation. You see a map on the right-hand side which shows the Gulf Stream, but the Gulf Stream connected to a whole bunch of other currents that go actually all the way around the world. And I wanted to read one, um, one sentence here under shutdown. Global warming could, via a shutdown of the thermohaline circulation, trigger cooling in the North Atlantic, Europe, and North America. This would particularly affect areas such as the British Isles, France, and the Nordic countries, which are warmed by the North Atlantic drift. Major consequences, apart from regional cooling, it also include an increase in major floods and storms, a collapse of plankton stocks, warming or rainfall changes in the tropics or Alaska and Antarctica, more frequent and intense El Nino events, that's a, a, a current off the coast of Peru which can affect the climate of California and indirectly Utah. El Nino effects associated, uh, d due to associated shutdowns of the Kuroshio, Lewin, and East Australian currents that are connected to the same thermohaline circulation as the Gulf Stream, or an ocean anoxic event. Oxygen below surface levels of the stagnant oceans becomes completely depleted, a probable cause of past mass extinction events. So ocean current disruption could potentially be pretty dramatic not only for Europe. 
Finally, I want to talk here about tipping points. Tipping points are situations where a small change can have a big and irreversible effect. And as an example of a tipping point, think about uh, methane in permafrost. So we know that methane, CH4, is a greenhouse gas. There's lots of methane, well, it's not actually methane trapped in perm permafrost, but it's organic material trapped in permafrost, like for instance, peat. So there's lots of organic material trapped in permafrost around the Arctic Ocean, and not in the Arctic Ocean, although some of it's on the, the seabed of the Arctic Ocean, but in land areas like Alaska and Siberia that are around the Arctic Ocean. Now, suppose the permafrost continues melting. It's already started to melt. As it melts, this organic material gets unfrozen and begins to get exposed to the atmosphere and starts to rot. As it rots, you produce methane. And there are already uh, places in the Arctic Ocean where you've got bubbles coming up from the sea floor. And the bubbles are methane bubbles caused by rotting of organic material, which used to be frozen but isn't frozen anymore. Well, methane's a greenhouse gas. So as the temperature goes up, the organic material defreezes, starts to rot, generates methane. Methane, being a greenhouse gas, causes the temperature to increase, which causes more permafrost to melt, which causes more organic material to rot, which causes more methane to increase, and so forth. So the concern is that you get to a tipping point where even if, let's say, all anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases were to stop, you'd still have an increase in greenhouse gases now because of nature. You have a vicious cycle where this natural cycle of increased temperature causing rotting organic material, causing increased methane, which causes increased temperature, that that natural cycle would continue even if humans weren't doing anything to affect the environment anymore and cause in some sense, run away uh, climate change until essentially all that organic material had rotted. So that's another concern. We don't know all the potential tipping points, but if we ever went beyond a tipping point, then there'd literally be nothing humans can do unless we invented some sort of anti-greenhouse gas technology or anti-global warming technology, which at this point is just completely speculative.